Hello, and welcome to the Be Purely Balanced podcast. I'm Dr. Crystal Couture, and today I'm here with Jamie Culbertson talking about the Alexander Technique. Jamie is an internationally certified Alexander Technique instructor and teacher trainer currently at the Boston Conservatory at Berkeley Alexander Technique teacher training course. She is a faculty member at the Alexander Technique Center at Cambridge. Jamie served as the chair on the board of the Alexander Technique International, ATI, and various committees for 12 years. Jamie is a senior instructor at the Universal Healing Tao System, founded by Master Montak Chia. She is also a teacher trainer certifying new instructors. She's a senior instructor and media producer for the Boston Healing Tao School of Taoist Practices in Somerville, Massachusetts. Her studies and classes include Tai Chi, Qigong, and meditation techniques. Welcome, Jamie. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It's happy to be here. Thank you. Um, I'm so happy to, to have you on and connect with you today in, in a conscious conversation. Absolutely. I'm really happy to be able to talk to you and your listeners about the Alexander Technique and uh, a little bit more of maybe what's available to them to have a more conscious life. Absolutely. So before we dive into the topic of the Alexander Technique, why don't you tell us about your journey into healing and really becoming a healer? Thank you for that. Um, it's, it's always a journey, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I would say in the um, late 80s, uh, you know, becoming um, a person who, I think everybody has a healing ability. It's just whether you develop it or not, and whether you feel like being in, of service to the world in that way. And often the crossroads uh, for taking that path comes from having your own issue or condition that you need to change in order to have a healthier life. Uh, and be well and conscious and, you know, go from sickness to flow and freedom. So I did have uh, an issue with my reproductive system in the late 80s. And um, that particular gynecologist wanted to do surgery. And as it goes, there's often this confluence of events that happen at a time of crisis. And so right around that time, I met these people who lived with more conscious life, uh, holistic living, uh, nutrition, food as medicine, uh, uh, spiritual connection. And I hadn't awoken to that yet in my life. I was at the time uh, a musician, uh, living kind of a crazy musician life. Um, singing, songwriting, performing, recording, and um, being a house painter to pay my bills and live out that part of my art, artistic self. And at this juncture, I met a woman who was given six months to live 20 years ago, <laughs> <laughs> right? And she was a Lakota medicine woman living in this same area as me. And we just were in the same place at the same time and began to connect and talk. And, and other people who knew her said, well, you know what? Maybe you should get a second opinion. And we know this doctor, her name is Christian Northrup. And she lives up in Maine and has a practice in Maine. Now, this was a great fortune for me. Um, she was not so famous at the time, Dr. Northrup. For now, she's done a lot of PBS specials and written lots of books. So... I called and I was able to get an appointment. And I'd never seen a female doctor before. Uh, the first thing she asked me when I went up there for medical help was, what do you do for creativity? Hmm. So that in itself was healing. Yeah. Was like, wow, this person is interested in my life, not just my body. And, um, and then she gave me a hug when I left the appointment. What about that? <laughs> so um, from there, I, I went on this journey and, and learned about food as medicine. And uh, she basically said, I'll give you four months. And if things don't change, I'll suggest a really good surgeon to you that she respects. So I thought, well, this is fair and helpful and supportive. And if I have to go that route, 
I'll go that route. And it turned out I didn't have to. So I went through a real holistic process of addressing my body with food, uh, learning to understand and face my emotional world, which was rather scattered and diffuse and unfamiliar, um, to check my um, mental capacity through some talk therapy. And um, with the relationship I had with this Lakota woman, I was able to uh, do some spiritual ceremonies with her. Mm. So I really covered all the bases of body, mind, spirit, emotions into this really whole process that at times certainly wasn't easy. But what made it possible was love. Mm. Um, the love and support of a new kind of community made it all possible. And then a few years later, I discovered Tai Chi. And a few years after that, I discovered the Alexander Technique. There's little stories of the journeys and those discoveries and how I came upon those decisions. Um, but it was all part of the new path that I was on, that there was just no turning back at all because of the transformations that were happening. And it wasn't always easy. Um, Sometimes it was like having my face in the mud, you know, um, which had to do with humility and looking at the, um, the dirt, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the things that you've collected through the years that, you know, weren't serving me anymore, including the excess that had accumulated in my reproductive system. Mm. So that had to slowly dissolve and leave my body and it did and um i learned about what it meant to be become whole mm. yeah wow so tell us a little bit about how you then became attracted to the alexander technique well i have a rather unique story with that as well okay um, a friend of mine so this was in the late 80s so and all this juncture around the late 80s, early 90s was powerful. Uh, a good friend of mine said that she had just had a, a psychic reading with this guy locally. And I thought, wow, that's so interesting. I mean, i would never done that before. And she said it was really positive. He was also a musician and a writer. I thought, well, why don't you give me his number? Because I have some questions about direction in my life now that I was becoming more whole and more present and more um, wondering how I was going to take what I loved in the past and brought it forward, whether it was music or, you know. So I call this guy and I go over to his house. I'm sitting with him. Now, this is the late 80s, so he had a tape recorder, the cassette player, right? Because he always recorded his readings. And I said that I had questions about direction in my life. And I really felt like I had something going on with my hands when I touched people. Um, and I wanted to follow that, but then I had this music desire to continue with, and I wanted to follow that, and maybe one other two things. And it seemed like, to me, they were going all in different directions. But he says to me, well, why don't you do them all? <laughs> <laughs> so he saw the best spokes on a wheel, and I could be in the center. And he asked me if I'd ever heard of the Alexander Technique, and I said, uh, not really. I mean, I had, but I didn't know what it was. And he said that he th thought that it would help me to be a better singer and so that I would not eventually get arthritis. Mm -hmm. And maybe I would also like to teach it. So I said, okay, that's pretty interesting. Um, all sounds good. And he says, I have a name for you, but it's not coming to me now. So then we went into our reading for a good long hour. And right at the end, he was bringing his finger over to turn off the tape player. And he paused and said, Tommy Thompson. Click. So I said, well, who's that guy? So I did a little search in the area. He was a local and I found him. <laughs> I told him what happened and he was very intrigued to, you know, be sent by the divine message. And I met him and it kind of rolled out from there. I took some lessons and uh, learned about his training course and, uh, did a lot of contemplation of whether that really is what I wanted to do. And it, it didn't take too long to uh, decide that 
for one thing, I thought how fascinating by receiving lessons from him, I got a sense of what I would be doing. And I realized that it's, there's such a fascination there that I wouldn't, I would not get bored doing it. You know, I had already tried shiatsu, which I thought was wonderful. Uh, I didn't want to do massage, although I appreciate a good massage. I just didn't want to do the naked bodies with the oil and everything <laughs> myself, myself. You know? And um, so this just seemed the most fascinating. And, uh, and it truly has been because it's been almost 30 years and I'm still fascinated by it. <laughs> so it's a good way of coming to the technique. Yeah. So your, your, your passion and fascination is still present after 30 years of, of doing what you do, which is so awesome. It's, it is. it's yeah. notable. Um, so now before we go any further, let's talk about what is the Alexander technique because people have to be curious by this point. Sure. It's certainly you can't, can't tell what it is by the name, you know? Yeah. But, um, one of the hallmarks of the technique is that the practitioner has to be living and embodying their understanding of the technique in order to be effective for the mm -hmm. person in front of them or the group in front of them. So that makes it a little different than other things. And I would simply say that it's a method to promote the evolution of humankind, which results in improvement in your coordination, your balance, clarity of mind, and overall happiness, the ability to really be present. Um, this happens by evoking an organizing principle in the body, which uh, has to do with the relationship of the skull and the spine in the environment that you're in called earth, gravity. <laughs> um, it, you know, it's, you're never just working with the body because the body is perhaps where we feel a lot of sensation, but there's no separation with the mind, the body, our emotional reality, and our spirit. And that's one of the things that Alexander kind of woke up to himself to say, now for him, he coined the phrase psychophysical unity. He was talking about the body and the mind. Uh, but there really wasn't a word for it in the English language and still to also say, you know, the spirit, the emotions, our mental capacity. So I'll just say it's our holistic being. Mm. And you, you can't separate any of that. There really are no parts. Parts of the body might give you sensation of discomfort and such, but it's supported and organized by the whole. You can access the whole through any part. You know, the whole can take care of any of these parts. But based on how we use ourselves to go through our activities of the day and what degree of compression may be going on, right, which makes us then have to hold on to our bodies more, adding tension, um, that will interfere with your ability to respond in the moment um, clearly and presently. Hmm. I'll pause there in terms of description because I could go on and on from into it because um, it's very simple technique, but we're up against our habits of a lifetime in the way that we respond to different stimulus around us. And you see, change is happening quite quickly in the modern world. It's different than hundreds of years ago when our, even through generations at that time, things were more slow to occur. Um, our degree of fight or flight or safety was different in the past. And there's so many changes happening now that in the modern society, people really don't have time to stop and think even or know that that would be helpful. Yeah. Um, so people need help in adapting because if we're in a state of reaction all the time, that's more of that fight or flight thing that happens in the body um, and stress. There is a compression where we literally pull the skull down towards the spine, uh, bringing on you know neck tension that, that does that. 
but that's based on a reaction. We don't choose, well, I think I'll tense my neck and shorten my stature. <laughs> it's based on a reaction to a stimulus of something going on around us or your own thoughts. Uh -huh. right? yeah. And that excites the fight or flight reflex in the body and the nervous system goes into alarm, right? And even people's resting place can still be a mild fight or flight. Mm. And certainly people with PTSD are in high, high alarm. So this Alexander Technique principles help to flip the switch to um, elicit the parasympathetic nervous system, which is more that calming. I'm at ease. I can make choices based on where I am in the moment. So um, to, to simplify a little bit, perhaps oversimplify, um, as the body has a physical response, an emotional response, a spiritual response, an intellectual response to some kind of stimuli, negative stimuli or even excitatory stimuli, mm -hmm. our body has a response due to, you know, our, our nervous system. And that response creates postural uh, patterns, right? And, and those patterns can be extremely detrimental to us, even though we don't have awareness of what's happening. That's right. Yeah. Well, kind of, uh, Alexander's typically known to help people with posture, but it, that's more of a result. And yeah. I've never had anybody in all this time say, hello, would you please help me with my posture? <laughs> they come with other, other reasons, unless you're following hints from Heloise and, and <laughs> you want to walk with a book on your head with balance. Um, people come for other reasons and having that depth of coordination and being able to stand fully and easily on the ground as a vertical being, you know, dogs and cats have four legs. Right? Humans have two legs to balance on. So any kind of stiffness or holding can create, oh, the falling, you know, it's like then you become a ladder and, and you need to lean against something. Mm. So then people use more like a, a surface tension, like compressing from the outside in to hold on so they don't fall. And I call that plan B. It's a great thing so that we don't walk around bumping into things. Sure. Plan A is to reduce that surface tension and allow an involuntary lengthening to happen along the spine as it relates to the head so that we can feel supported that's innate to the design of the body. Mm. Okay? And the rest of it with our spiritual, you know, I don't mean spiritual like a religion or belief system. I literally mean spirit in the body. Um, now you mentioned yeah. I, I also do, I'm a universal healing Tao instructor having studied with Montan Chia. And what he would say is, it doesn't matter what you believe in, whether you know it or not, you have a spirit, so you might as well learn to deal with it. Yeah. And in fact, it's my spirit that's animating my body until mm -hmm. the day that I don't. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So that's just part of the whole picture. Um, and that's a whole other thing to embody. You want to embody your mind. You want to eventually, if when you consider your spirit, you know, that's, that's really what's uh, part of what's filling you up also. Mm. Um, but the movement happens from the inside out, you know? So, okay, so shifting movement patterns, that idea, because I think many people do think a movement happens kind of from the outside, right? Mm -hmm. So shifting these movement patterns from the inside out, retraining movement patterns, um, you know, obviously it does great things for the body. And I think most people that have heard of the, the Alexander Technique, as you say, will assume that this is the direction, right? It's going to improve balance. It's going to improve coordination, posture, so on, so on. Mm -hmm. Uh, why is that so beneficial for the other parts of us? Why is that so beneficial for the spirit? What, where's the connection? It's a great question. It really is. And I certainly wouldn't say to someone, well, when you come here, you're going to have a spiritual experience. <laughs> that is, you can't really even predict 
the kind of experience someone would have. It's unique to them. While there are some common things that a person might feel taller, they might feel more grounded, a little lighter, that's very common. But each person will have their own unique experience based on you know, what it means to them. And see, the thing is we live in and through our bodies on this planet Earth. And so the body is often gonna give us the uh, wake up call or the impulse or the little pain here, the soreness, the heaviness through our kinesthetic sense. And our kinesthetic sense teaches us about change. Like I feel heavy, I feel light. I can hold my hand up above my head where I can't see it, and I know I've got four fingers. Maybe No, maybe two fingers now. So I know I can sense the change. Um, and that happens through the body. In fact, whatever I'm looking at right now, I may be looking out the window and looking at the trees, and I see the fence, I see the people, but everything out there is going on because of my body my eyes, the way they relate to my head, my brain, I mean, you know, and that enables me to see. So in that sense, there isn't any there out there. Obviously, I walk over there, I can talk to that person. I'm not saying it's invisible. I'm saying that what I see and hear around me is happening because of my body and how my body functions, right? So to be able to understand for instance that if I have a desire and I want to walk over there and say hello to that person most of my energy goes towards what I want and sometimes there's such a forward or a narrow thrust towards that it creates a narrowing in the body as well little muscle fibers kind of grab on and then I've got to handle myself on my way over there so I can be balanced and upright or hold on more because I've narrowed myself into what I want. Right. Mm. So in that sense, our desires are fine, but whether we um, have how we feel about whether we have them yet, have what we want yet or not is shows up in the body. Right. Um, wasn't it Buddha has said that desires creates the struggle. That's only Buddhist thing. Pardon me if I'm not graceful in talking about that, but it's not so much the desire we have that every day, but it's how we react to really having it yet. Mm. We might be thirsty and reach for the bottle, but my body might feel like, oh my God, I want it in my mouth already. <laughs> <laughs> I, need, I need the process to get it to reach from the table to my mouth. Um, you said simple, so I'm, I'm go kind of go out going off into different stories here. Um, there's a way of doing and the, there's a way of non-doing that we can choose through our awareness and our conscious choice to affect the body so we can feel more coordinated. We do need to use muscular strength. That's what I call maybe that outside tension of doing um, to do activities, to speak, to walk, to lift things up. But we usually do that in excess because first of all, we're actually balancing, trying not to fall over. So we start with tension and then we add more to do things. And there's a certain muscle group that is short spurt. We contract, we lift, we let go, we go get another box, we lift it up, we put it over there. And that's what those muscles are designed for. A muscle set that is involuntary uh, travels along the spine, relates to the head, and its only job is to lengthen mm -hmm. and give you that support away from any compression. So in order to allow for that to occur, we have to stop using the other types of contraction in excess because it's involuntary. Right. So uh, this is this is making me think a bit. Um, I know that you're a musician, 
um, it, you've had some experience, obviously, with musicians. Mm -hmm. And I, I realize now in, in Boston from, from when I started hearing about the Alexander Technique, it was through dance and music. Mm -hmm. And so now I'm thinking about, you know, myself as a dancer and as a musician from so long ago and thinking about these postures, these recurrent, uh, you know, patterns, which are, mm -hmm in order to be creative, they're the outlet, right? We use very often similar contraction patterns and similar ways of movement just to produce creatively. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking about this for, and I guess I can relate to music and dance because that's part of my background, but I suppose there are many other, mm -hmm. um, you know, creative hobbies or jobs or what have you that would fit into the same category. Mm -hmm. Essentially, by building our awareness, by expanding, you know, that, that inward to outward and, and being aware of lengthening, it sounds to me like we'll have a much greater chance by using something like the Alexander Technique to actually allow our creative outlets to come through us without our own restrictions in the way without our own even ego per se in the way. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. That's well said and it can be really surprising what that new moment shows up like. Yeah. So it does allow for creativity, spontaneity, and an ability to adapt to change, which is what's happening a lot through dance movement. Um, but certainly even in a conversation with a non, you know, musician and such. Um, uh, uh, an Alexander teacher can help to wake this up in you. You've already got it. It's part of your design, but you don't know that you have a choice for that. And you're only in what you know. Mm. So an Alexander teacher through conversation, through a gentle touch can help to evoke that change by helping you do less of what you're already doing. That might be interfering with that depth of uh, coordination and that, that free spontaneous moment. Yeah. And certainly artists, as well as other, other um, uh, jobs, they do a lot of repeated mo movements when you're practicing your scales over and over again. You're, my goodness, the, the students are practicing six, seven hours a day. Yeah. And what I want to make a point of now is to say that, okay, you've got someone who's incredibly busy. And the students are practicing six, seven hours a day. They have classes, they have gigs, they have to get there, they have to eat. Oh, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and so this should not be thought of as another thing to do. Hmm. Right in the midst of what you're doing, you have a chance to make a more of a conscious choice. Hmm. So this is a process of learning that will bring you into that understanding that I can make a different choice right now, mm. uh, right in the middle of what you're doing. And this idea of non-doing is not passive. You don't, it's not like sit back and relax and everything will start to open up and free up. It, it has a lot to do with intention. Mm. But people mostly think of intention as a mental activity. I'm going to intend to do this in my life and you have a future vision of what you want to create college house marriage all that you can intend in the morning in the moment i'm going to do this dance rehearsal and i'm going to intend to be really present so i can react spontaneously to the other actors or whatever um <laughs> but intention doesn't happen without the heart mm. truly a lively intention and you know, now I'll, I, I, I walk the parallel path with the Alexander technique and the Tao and learning about meditation and Tai Chi so one informed the other a little bit um, there's something in uh, a Chinese uh, philosophy called your E and it's spelled Y-I and what it means is it's a combination of your mind your heart and your inner eye and that means intention so how do you have or use an inner eye it still has to be a combination of that which includes the heart and 
an inner eye might be used for one thing is to okay so where is your navel <laughs> where's your belly button you can point to it on your body but if you went, went inside a couple inches ha huh, you bring your mind inside and maybe perhaps you connect to a lower energy center there um, if i want to use the classic directions in the alexander technique which is to allow the neck to be free so my head can move and my spine or my back can lengthen and widen in order to allow you know people tend to go into the neck and want to free it and allow and change that and all um, and that's uh, uh, just an inward direction and that's more mechanistic in approach like your body's a machine, you gotta move this, that. But actually, if you include your environment or your, the other dancer in your performance, um, you're connecting out in the world around you from where you are. And, and you can do both. You can allow for some change to happen through this inner eye, heart, mind process of intention while you're in activity. Mm. So that is part of the teaching of how that can happen for a person. And again, the results are spontaneity, more coordinated, free, light stepping movement. Um, it's, and it's often surprising, you know, yeah. in that next moment when you come outside of your habitual way into, uh, and really the simplicity is when you release that compression of your skull down towards the spine, towards the ground in the different methods I'm, sort of describing a little bit you know you have this change physiologically and then your movements are reflected in that or the thing you want to say next mm. or what you're striving for becomes less um i don't want to say less intense if that's a good thing but more you're more able to receive even the quality of expectation to having your desire met mm. oh that's that's so beautifully put um and i i think this is a perfect segue into this question it, you haven't used it today but in your website and your teachings i hear you using this word flow so often so let's open the floodgates and <laughs> let's go into flow because i know it's so important for you to share about flow Oh, thank you. Yeah, funny how I hadn't used it already, but um, <laughs> flow is what happens when there's no impedance, mm. right? So it exists already. Um, so clearly you can see a river that can flow eventually down into the ocean. And when we put a dam in and it impedes the flow and it creates a lot of resistance so we could use that, uh, the potential that comes from the resistance to create electricity, things like that with the dam. But sometimes it's a river in the, in the woods and then you have a little eddy over there and you have all these leaves that pile up and it gets kind of stagnant there. Mm -hmm. And that's just nature, that's what's happening. The leaves are falling. So there's less flow there, right? But if you rake out the leaves, then the flow will happen. So one way I can translate this to the body is let's say uh, someone comes in and they have some back pain. So my approach is not so much to work with the tension or the pain, but I'm gonna change, help to change conditions in the body so that the tension becomes unnecessary. Mm. So that's an indirect approach. Um, now, if there's an injury, then the body needs time to heal. But what we tend to do is we react to the injury. So why, while the injury, may, it, the injury might be uh, the uh, you know one centimeter, two centimeters, and there's a little inflammation there or whatever, but the reaction could be huge all around the back and affecting your walking, affecting your mood. So as we change conditions by changing the balance of the head on top of the spine, in the environment that we're in, the excess tension we're, we're using to deal with all that injury starts to resolve. 
Mm. And then you get to see, oh, okay, it's right there. That's where you need time to heal. Yeah. yeah. So if it's possible, I would love for our listeners today um, perhaps to participate in something. So is there some simple like cueing or exercise that you can kind of guide the listeners um, through that they could do in, in very simple uh, way, simple space, but to notice a little bit of what we've been talking about? Yeah, uh, uh, let's try something. Okay. And uh, you could certainly give your feedback because you're the one that's with me. Um, but I would suggest that people take a moment and whether they're sitting or standing and just use one of your hands to touch your neck. Right, so maybe you're going to bring your hands where your fingers are on the back of your neck and then allow the elbow of that arm just to relax, just so you're not creating more holding just to put your hand there. Right? So and just breathe and feel your body. But with your hand there, you're going to be able to feel how what's going on with the neck and the throat and all that. So I would like to take a moment and suggest to you without doing it just yet, to mm, have an intention to perhaps move, walk, get up, uh, reach for something on your desk, uh, but don't do it just yet. Okay, good. So that is, I've set up a little bit of a conflict there because I'm giving you something to do and asking you not to do it yet. Now you're feeling your neck, but you've got a whole body that's involved with this intention. And a person might feel that they start to get ready. They start to either feel tension in the legs if they're going to get up, or their breathing changes, or perhaps they start to picture, okay, how am I going to move? Right? I wonder if any of that happened for you. Yeah, so I feel my intention was to reach for something on the desk in front of me. Mm -hmm. So I felt the contraction in my postural um, posterior shoulder muscles, you know, getting ready to stabilize. Right. Okay, great. So that's what we would call a reaction, just to your own idea of doing something. Right. So that, and that's unconscious, right? And that's a way of kind of getting ready, and then we get set. And then we're already using a bunch of effort. And then when we move, we start from that place of contraction and effort. So now let's turn it around a little bit. And you can put your hand on the neck again and relax the elbow. And so this time you can decide to reach for the same thing, same activity or something different. And as you notice yourself getting ready, you can just say, oh, no, I don't have to get ready because I'm actually not doing it yet. Right? And so you, I just, you're, you get this big breath that just happened for you, right? Yeah. So you're retraining your neuromuscular system right now that you don't have to do it only in one way that you've been doing it, in that unconscious reactive way. But now you're more conscious about it and say, well, I'm actually not moving yet. I can be free and at ease where I am, not get ready. And now your body starts to coordinate differently. To, and when you go ahead and do the activity, you're able to move from there, which is less of that contractive pattern. Hmm. Right? Yeah. And the reason I have your hand on your neck is to, sometimes people feel that a, a contraction goes along with that. And you can feel that compression that's also happening there. So that's one little bit of a awareness exercise, if you will, to see how you are reacting to your own thoughts of what you want. Right. And how that could also change. Yeah. And of course it goes just, just like so many things that we talk about here on the podcast, it goes so far beyond the actual physical experience. Yeah. It, it comes through with everything. So I want to ask you, um, you mentioned it today when we first started ch chatting and intuitively I had this sense um, about you feeling and interpreting through your own hands. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a great time for us to just briefly talk about th the sensation that you're feeling in your hands and how you've trained yourself as you're working with clients, as you're spending time with them. Um, 
to, to interpret or assess or mm -hmm. feel or heal, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I could first say certainly the Alexander Technique is not especially something that uh, people come or do for healing, but you learn a lot. Healing comes from what you learn, right? Yeah. So, yeah, we learn to listen and even see with our hands, if you will. But it's still that my hands are only a part of me. And my intelligent system uh, is involved with the whole process. So a woman I work with at the Boston Conservatory, her name is Debbie Adams, and she's the director of the training. And she coined this wonderful phrase called hands last. And in that way, what I want to do is elicit the organizing principle for my entire being, myself, my body, so that I'm free and at ease on my approach to touching someone. Mm. And so changes could come on my way there or even standing next to someone. And those changes can come a little bit under the radar because our habits are not so conscious at times. So, but to be near that level of organizing that we've got in the human body as we relate to gravity and our environment can be picked up on someone. So by the time I touch them, it's just, it's another communication. I'm communicating through our eye contact, the words, language contact, and then I touch, and that's another kind of contact. Now, often it's more direct, and then we can get a sense of that kinesthetic change a little more deeply. But learning to listen with your hands and then assess and then decide what choice you're going to make next as the person starts to open and release, um, that comes through a lot of practice. And the training course for an Alexander teacher, a, a good training course in my opinion, um, is 1,600 hours. That's basically, that's uh, common. And it's usually done over a period of three years. And that's in a training course. Yet at that, I'd also like to say that there's not a training course available to everybody in the world. So there's also a way to study and learn to teach it um, as through an apprentice situation. And in fact, I've, you, I do that with some people online but you can only go so far before now, now you have to touch, you have to make contact with hands and we have to be in the same room so I can feel your hands and what is being communicated and help you understand that. So mm -hmm. you continue to improve your, how you, you organize yourself while you make contact with another person. Before that, I mean, you make contact with the world, you know, and again, like I said, I see that tree out there, but it's happening from where I am. So it, it helps me come back to myself. And now I can really more fully embody my mind and my full fullness of my body from where I am and interact. It's not an other. It's not me here, that out there. It's a relationship. Mm. So the contact with the hands is incredibly helpful. And again, it's feedback. And if you're using your intention, which includes your heart, I mean, the, the hand is connected, uh, the meridian wise, right on up to the pericardium, which is the surrounding area of the heart. And so, you know, you keep that in mind. Um, you can touch someone with a great deal of compassion, which hopefully is part of um, everybody's understanding when they do make contact with someone. Mm. Yeah. So finally, before we... Before we close today, what would you say would be the most um, important thing that you want to share, perhaps even intuitively, with this group of listeners that we have? Oh, great. Great way to talk about that. Yeah, take a moment. <sighs> well, certainly that we, ha we have choice. We have choice in how we want to respond to any stimulus in the moment. And it's so easy to react in this crazy, chaotic world <laughs> and only be engaged with that but and, and miss being able to see the beauty and the innovation that's also happening. So listen to your body. It's a great barometer so that you know how you feel about something. 
And I'll use an example, if you will, with, of the yin-yang symbol. It's pretty common. You see it in Tai Chi uh, or hippie stores. You know, it's the, uh, the two fishes in the circle. It represents unity and harmony. But often people see the one side's black, the other side's white, or it's blue or red in the design. And that represents the opposites or our preferences. I like this, I don't like that. It's night, it's day. Woman, man. Republican, Democrat, <laughs> right? It's our preferences. And that creates opposition. Yet, and that is reflected in your body. But in Tai Chi, for instance, there is no opposition. You have to remember the circle that surrounds the two. And that's that oneness that embodies our oppositions, right? Mm. So anytime I find myself reacting to the world and things going on, and I have my preferences, I'll step back for a moment and just say, no, but, but we are all in this together. We are all one. I have a choice in how I want to respond. And rather than try to manage the world, if I can manage my energy as I'm touched by these different things going on, moved by it, I can decide how I want to interact, how I want to go through the day, and how I could help myself in my body to feel better. Mm. To accept the emotional reaction that comes with our preferences. Yeah. And, and realize that, oh, these are, this is my experience. Right? And it's true for me, but it's not the universal truth. It's my experience. Mm. So I can stand in what's true for me, but still be open to what's going on for you, you know? So it, it helps me in relationship to what is otherwise seemingly an opposition. So we have choice. We don't have to base every action in word on our past. We can enjoy new perspectives in our points of view on a moment to moment basis through that creativity, adaptability to change and the spontaneous new moment that can come from reorganizing yeah, how you stand on, on the ground and a little freedom of the skull into movement and a new balance on top of the spine gives you that. Yeah. Oh, this was such a powerful conversation. I, I love the depth that we got to. So if our listeners do want to get in touch with you, Jamie, um, you have two websites, so why don't you share them? And yeah. Sure. Um, one is my name basically in short. It's jamiec.com. J A M two E's C dot com. Uh, and that's a general overview of what I do and other ways to reach me through email and phone number. Um, and I have another website uh, on a project that I created and it's called the one, uh, not the, but 100 day practice.com. And I use the number one zero zero practice.com. And what that project is that a couple times a year, uh, perhaps we, have day one, and we invite people to join us in a, in a closed Facebook group to come in and commit to something that they would like to do. Whether they want to write a book, they want to practice Tai Chi every day, they want to meditate every day, um, but they want some support for that, some accountability. I hold the space for that, right? Everybody makes their own commitment, but we hold the space for that. And it's been a great community. Um, and then, so it's just another thing that I offer. It's not specific to the Alexander Technique, but I pretty much bring my knowledge of the Alexander Technique into anything that I do. Mm -hmm. And we're all in there together, we're practicing something. So it's, it's just another thing that I've started and can offer people. A conscious experience. Yeah, yeah, absolutely.
Yeah. Beautiful. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we close, Jamie? I'd like to thank you so much for reaching out to me. Uh, and uh, now I can, I've listened to some of your other podcasts and I'm really enriched by the people that have come on. So I'm honored and humbled to be a part of that community that you're oh. <laughs> space you've also created for people to come and be a part of conscious conversation so i would just enjoy saying to people uh gosh thank you for listening reach out to me if you've got more questions or something to share with me and uh make sure you tap into your heart today it's inside your chest the physical heart but it's also where the energetic space is if you tap into your heart with your feet on the ground you look around you you can find something um, new that maybe you didn't see before. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Jamie. My pleasure. Thank you, too.